So we have a, uh, this is our last fireside chat and then we're done for the, uh, for the afternoon. Uh, I was specifically looking forward to this one. This is how social is changing content distribution and production. Uh, let's welcome the co-founder of collegehumor.com and he's done a lot of other good stuff. Ricky Van Veen, welcome to the stage. Thank you. And uh, why don't you take the middle seat unless you right. want to not sit next to me. No, middle, middle seat works. <laughs> So, uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing recently in terms of content and distribution. Sure. So um, I started College Humor with a friend in 2000. Um, we've, we also started a video sharing site called Vimeo, which I think a lot of people know, uh, an apparel business called Busted Tees. We put those together, sold them to IAC. And since then, I've been at IAC overseeing those properties and um, overseeing College Humor we spun out busted tees, and uh, and do, doing other things like uh, we just released an app for College Humor. We have our first movie coming out in July. So doing a lot of things, expanding from that core College Humor brand. Got it. So tell us a little bit how you believe content and distribution is changing in the last uh, few years. Sure. So we're going from what I would call a portal-based world to a social world, and. And I think a lot of people are aware of that, but they're not as aware of how it's changing content itself. So when we, you know, when we used to make a piece of content, we would just say, will people click on this? And because we knew people were just coming to the homepage, and if it got a lot of clicks, it would get a lot of views. And there was a little bit of virality in you know, the email forward or calling people over to your desk, but there wasn't, it wasn't as, fluid, to borrow a word from today, it wasn't as fluid as it is now with, you know, if someone, someone likes a piece of content, they're not only a viewer, but they're an evangelist. And they are literally sharing it with all their friends. So to get back to my point, the way it's changing content is now when we look at making a piece of content, we don't just say, is this good? We say, will it be shared? And something will be shared if it allows the consumer to say something about themselves. So. A classic example is if you share an article from The Economist, you're trying to say, I'm smart. And, and if you share a, a joke, you, you're saying, I get this joke, and I think you'd like it too. Um, so that's the, kind of the new sieve that we use. Right. So how, tell us a little bit more about sharing and why that's important to marketers or advertisers. How can that help them? Well, it's important if you want virality in in content, and um, and because if your if your piece of content isn't something that's shareable, you're going to have to buy all those views, and then you end up with in this place where a lot of I see a lot of people where they they try to make a viral video, and then they just end up buying a bunch of views to it because it doesn't have doesn't give people a reason to share it, and so you you kind of have to look at not not only is it good. But what does this allow people to say about themselves? And I brought one video with me, and it was our most popular video of, the, of 2012 by leaps and bounds. And I don't think it would have been that popular had we put it out five years ago, not only for, um, for the, because it was topical, but because n the video allowed people to say something about themselves while sharing it. The video was about gay marriage. And when you shared it, you, say, you said to your entire social network, this is my stance on this issue. So we can play that, I think it's two minutes. People say you spend so much time that's working, but that's if it's your right. passion, it isn't really work. I love that's the feeling you get when you make something all on your own. I love coming up with something new. Making it up. Yeah, the, the right one's called uh, Gay Marriage, if you're looking for the file name. <laughs> that was not, that's another video. That's unique. That's, yeah. That's, 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 uh, that's, Americans are becoming more comfortable with the idea of gay marriage, seeing it as both a moral and civil rights issue. But there are many out there who are still fighting against the cause. And as gay men ourselves, we would just like to say to those people, Fine. Keep marriage between a man and a woman. And in response, we will marry your girlfriends. We'll marry your girlfriends. What? You don't think we could? We'd be the best husbands ever. Have you seen us? <laughs> We are ripped. All of us are ripped. It doesn't seem statistically possible, and yet it's true. Because we love going to the gym. And you know who else loves going to the gym? 
your girlfriend. We will go to the gym with her, and then after, we'll get Pinkberry as a reward. That sounds like a great time to us. Not to mention, we dress better than you. While you were spilling Manwich on your cargo shorts, we were inspecting our Oxford shirts for the craftsmanship of their gauntlet buttons. What do you make your girlfriend for breakfast? Burnt scrambled eggs? We will make her a quiche. A motherfucking quiche. With a side of hummus made from scratch. Do you even know the difference between hummus and baba ganoush? You're a joke. And don't even get us started on dates. You don't want to go dancing? We teach a dance class. Urban tango. You're not on the list for that art gallery opening? We'll BBM the owner. Maurice. Not in the mood to go to that Broadway show? We are. We're in it. Yes, we would like to go to that 80s themed costume party. And no, we weren't just checking out that other girl. Obviously. Ew. We could listen to your girlfriend for hours, just reassuring her that she's not the crazy one. Cassandra is being a bitch. Also, her dad loves us. That's because he's not threatened by us. In fact, we're playing tennis with him right now. Well played, Mr. Bennett. Now you're probably thinking sex. That's where you have us beat. And we already know how she likes to be kissed. She thinks it's funny to make out with us when she's drunk. And you know all those sweet spots, preferences, and fantasies that she's too embarrassed to tell you or thinks you should innately know? Yeah, she's told us. We could play her like an upright bass. And the kind of threesome she wants? Oh, we're cool with that. As if all this isn't enough, we're the shoulder that your girlfriend cries on when she's complaining about hmm, you. We know literally all of your weaknesses. You are Death Stars, and we are an army of fabulous Luke Skywalkers. So remember, we're doing you a huge solid by being more attracted to each other than to your girlfriends. But if you stay close-minded about this, we will take one for the team and marry the crap out of them. So don't make us marry your girlfriends. Support gay marriage. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that got shared. Thank you. Uh, that got shared because... Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah because <laughs> who would have thought? Uh, but not only because it was funny, but because it's like, I always say content is a bumper sticker. I think that's that's where we're uh, that's where we're headed. So content is that's that's great. Someone should tweet that by the way. Content <laughs> is the bumper sticker. I like that. So so uh, there's a lot of marketers in the audience um, as well as publishers and mm -hmm. agencies alike, um, and we always struggle with what's the criteria that makes something viral or shareable. We're always struggling with that, and of course we have brands that sometimes have brands that are hard to create content that's shareable. Mm -hmm. Give us some sense about. That criteria, which which kind of the criteria that you folks look at, um, uh, yeah, or, or, or tools that you look, look at. It's the it's you know what I said before. Uh, let people say something about themselves, but also a lot of times people need an alibi when they share something. Uh, and you know, so for example, if you take Snapchat, it's a it's a it's something that that's really interesting to me because before it would have been you would have been self obsessed and ridiculous if you took just random photos of yourself and sent them to your friends. People would be like, why are you texting me this? But people just needed a platform to, to do that, and it made it OK. So I think uh, c considering you know, giving people that, that alibi, that excuse to share something is, is just as important as, uh, as letting people say something about themselves. Right. So you've come up with something called identity creation. Yes. Um, Tell the, uh, tell the audience, A, what it is. What's the definition of that and what exactly and how do you use it? Okay, so identity creation is the way people are able to create their personality online, which now for young people, that is their personality, what's online, by what they post. So if you, there's a whole spectrum of different, uh, different ways people can say something about themselves from permanent to more temporary. And the more permanent ones are like LinkedIn or Facebook. And the more... Temporary ones are Twitter, Snapchat. So if, if people want to say how they're feeling this afternoon, they'll use Twitter. And if people want to say you know, their favorite movie ever, they'll, they'll use Facebook. And so you have this whole continuum of ways people can, can build up who they are. And, uh, and I think that's leading to, to some interesting things. And one thing that I'm fascinated with is this idea of documentation leading experience instead of the other way around. And, and I, I talk about this a lot, and the, the best way to explain it is, you know, gr growing up, your parents would come home from a trip, and they would have pictures, and they would show you documentation of their experience. And now I see with young people, it's, it's flipped, and young people are making decisions as to what to do based on the documentation that will result. So for example, a 
somebody will, will get a, a second wind to go out to a bar because they know they can get that Foursquare badge. Or a high school girl will say, you know, should I, should I go to homecoming? Well, this is, it will look good on my Instagram feed and everyone will know I went. And, and I think that's, that's a really important thing for marketers to remember, to, to give people, to, to let people, I guess it plays into the, the alibi and identity creation, uh, you know, picturing what the documentation will be even before what the market, what the experience will be what, that they're, while they're being marketed to, if I say that clearly. <laughs> so is it, is it a tool, is it a device? Is it like a research device, identity creation? Um, or is it more a concept? I think it's, it's more a concept and the tools are what you use, whether it's Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook. Got it. So how have you used identity creation in some of the projects that you've worked on? Um, we target, one way we do it is we target things, uh, I call it candy corn, which is uh, kind of a, a cousin of nostalgia. And if you look at our generation, it's, uh, for people my age, it's like stuff like Saved by the Bell, right? Where you have these little pieces of nostalgia and you po if you post it on Tumblr, it's gonna get a bunch of reblogs because people just like to say, hey, yeah, I remember that. And so a lot of content we make, we know like, all right, well, people love the 90s and people love kind of reliving those cultural touchstones. And I mean, if you look at like the top articles on BuzzFeed, it's all just nostalgia, right? Because that's what people share. People like to say to their friend, hey, do you remember that? And we build that into our content creation process frequently. Got it. Um, how would you suggest, uh, that, that's actually a really good description, so how would you suggest marketers or advertisers take advantage of this concept of, uh, of content uh, or identity creation? Huh. Um, I think it's, it's just considering the end result of, like picture how some, so for example, if you're putting on an event, right? It's, I, would, I would say it's not, in, uh, there's a celebrity there. It's not even worth having the celebrity there unless attendees can get their photo taken. Right. Because uh, it, it, there's this like teen slang, picks or it didn't happen. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something to consider. Like, you know, we'll forget about the process. What's the, what's the end result? What's the documentation? And what will uh, an attendee's social media look like after they've watched the commercial, after they've read the article, after they've been to the event? Right. Perfect. Um, so you have a second video, I think, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so this why is, don't you introduce that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, and, and another, uh, as we go from a, a portal-based kind of search and find to a, to a shareable conversation model of content distribution, this is an example of something that is uh, less about saying, I'm, this is who I am, but I found this funny, I'm in on this joke, and starting a conversation around it. So this is a campaign we did with American Eagle we launched it on March 15th, thinking we'll put out this video, and it was a, for a fake product that American Eagle would have uh, called Skinny Skinny Jeans. And there's jeans that are even skinnier than skinny jeans, and, <laughs> but it's just painted on body paint. And we got American Eagle to actually put it in their online store, and we shot a commercial for it, and we said we'll seed it on March 15th, and then on April 1st, we'll say, April Fools, this was a joke. But it took off so fast that Literally, March 16th, the CEO of American Eagle was on the Today Show explaining that it was a joke. Because, it, it, and that's like that's just the speed of social content now. It just happens so fast. Like if you, like for example, like the Coney 2012 video. Like if you saw that 48 hours later, people would make fun of you. Be like, yeah, that was like two days ago. That's just the speed of this thing. So anyway, the, uh, I'll show the uh, the commercial we made for it. People say you spend so much time working, but if it's your passion, it isn't really work. I love the feeling you get when you make something all on your own. I love coming up with something new. Making it up as I go along. I don't want to be put in a box. I like skinny jeans. Sometimes they're not skinny enough. I love really skinny jeans. It's like they were made just for me. Live your life. American Eagle Outfitters. AE Skinny Skinny. Available for a limited time only at AE.com. And they had literally 1,500 people tried to buy this on their site. <laughs> and it looked like, like the, the actual product shot was just like two spray paint cans. It was really weird. <laughs>
So how did this come to life? I mean, it was, how, do you, how, do you work, how did you work with American Eagle? Yeah, so, and how did you get it approved? Uh, I think they were just willing to take a risk and it worked. Um, but they came to us, I think it was a, this, in this case it was a direct to brand thing, and, and they said, we, you know, we want to do an April Fool's prank. And at College Humor, we have the editorial team and the branded entertainment team are the same, right? So we have people who are in charge of brand entertainment, but when we brainstorm for an RFP or for a, an idea, it's the same people who write the sketches. So somebody pitched this idea, and we ran it by the client, and they were like, let's do it. So we, we shot the, the, this video, but we also, uh, we, you know, we're, not, we're a platform with 15 million unique visitors a month. We can also get the word out about it. So uh, we shot the video, then we advertised it like a real product, and we also did some in-store prank videos, which are going to be released soon, where we had fake American Eagle employees wearing the, the, the skinny, skinny jeans and trying to sell them. So it was a whole, it wasn't just that one video, it was a whole uh, 360 campaign. So that, that, that very quick uh, speed to get things out the door, that did get out the door and get passed along and shared and et cetera, how much of that, just ballpark it for me, how much of that was actually purchased, um, not so much ad media, but I'm talking purchase distribution? Give me a sense of that. Uh, I don't have the figure off is it, is it half or a quarter? Or? I'd say the production was probably a quarter of it, and then yep. the rest was media. Oh, great. So, uh, so sharing, one of the things you talked to me about earlier was that sharing really defines your identity. Um, how should brands, you know, I, I, you know, we talked a little bit about how people do that, but how should brands think about sharing and sharing content moving forward? We talked a little bit, but could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of your major thesis, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really simple. Like, I, I don't know how much m more there, there is to it. Like, it's um, just the idea of when you make any, like the, the, the Kmart video. Uh, that's, you, when someone comments on that, it gets posted to their Facebook feed. So even uh, beyond just saying something about yourself, saying, pe when people say something about the content itself, that will get shared to their friends. So creating things, that is, creating things that are likely to elicit reactions uh, is also just, in, just as important as creating things that let people say something about themselves. And I mean, I can't tell you how many people said like, you know, holy crap, this is a crazy video about that Kmart video. And it all goes uh, straight to your uh, social feeds. Right. So you've done other things besides college humor. Mm -hmm. you, you've launched the uh, the video sharing site, uh, but you've also done. Uh, you also had a lot of uh, success, help producing the Food Network's uh, hit Chopped. So tell us. Uh, so that's that's kind of a wide. That's that's cool. I mean, that's a Thanks. wide variety of things. So tell us how that materialized, given your early days with College Humor. Yeah. So at College Humor, we kind of looked at where we were, and we saw we had this great creative and production infrastructure. And, but we were, you know, at the time limited to digital only mm -hmm. and mostly young men that was, it's like 60, 40 uh, young men and, or men versus women. And we said, how can we break out of that and do, meaning let's do TV as well, let's do film as well, let's do genres besides comedy. And so there was this uh, kind of fledgling uh, non-scripted production company that, uh, that we acquired and back then, I think they were in the shop season one or two, and now it's in season 19. So that was, uh, it, that was how we got into that. And since then, we've had pilots go all around the world and a lot of game show formats uh, and that sort of thing. And then we're also beefing up the scripted side of the business, and we just did a deal with Jax Media, which produces Louie on FX, and they're doing Amy Poehler's new pilot. So really kind of taking this, this core I guess you'd call it IP and production infrastructure, and, and building out from that. Got it. So how important, out of, out of all that you're doing, how important is YouTube as a distribution platform? YouTube is, I'd say, as a distribution platform and as a marketing platform, it's crucial. Uh, not crucial, very important. Uh, as a revenue platform, it's not that significant. Um, in fact, I think... Give us, give us a perspective. Sure. So we, we have 20 minutes left. So I'd love to get your perspective on online video, the future of television, what you, what you think YouTube did right or did not do right with their 100 channels. They're heading into their second year of the upfront or the new front. Yeah, so, um, so with us, it's, it's a very interesting case because 
if we didn't, we are the, at least last week, we we're the number seven channel on all of YouTube. And we'll go up and down based on like whether Rihanna has a hit song that month or something. But you know, we're, we're a dominant player on YouTube. And we had this discussion very early. I remember being in uh, the, the boardroom of IEC saying like, this was four years ago or so, like we say, saying, should we put our content on YouTube? Because a lot of our competitors were taking it off. And we said, you know what, let's keep it on because and then, we can always, we always have that option in the future. And I'm glad we did because we were able to build up a following and now we have 4.3 million subscribers. And it helps our, our ad side because our, our salespeople can say to someone like American Eagle, not only can we make this, but we can put it in our channel and it will go out to that many people. And when that many people see something, if it's gonna go viral, if, if four million people see it and it doesn't go viral, it probably wasn't meant to go viral. So, so YouTube's been extremely uh, good for us that way, and it's been extremely good in terms of being, they changed their policy about three months ago where now you can link off of YouTube in videos. Before you could just link intro YouTube to other videos. And so if we have a, uh, a video that talks about um, like Prince Harry, and it's, there's a relevant link on our O&O site, on, on the collegehumor.com, we can link from YouTube to the, uh, to the O&O site. But my, my main takeaway from YouTube is, I, I think it's really interesting because if we didn't have our owned and operated property, we, our YouTube channel would be unprofitable in a day, right? YouTube for us is incremental revenue. And it couldn't support the cost, it, the cost of making the videos that actually go on the channel, even being in the top 10 channels. So, so for, for so me- that doesn't sound good. I mean, that, I mean, for the folks that have those 100 channels, and I've heard this before, that financially the model's not too lucrative for independent content producers. Yeah, I think Even if they're backed by big people. Yeah. Is that fair? I, I think that's probably, at least from what, from what we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, and YouTube's a, a very important part of our business, and I think it will get there, where eventually there, it, you, know, you will be able to make money on it. Uh, but right now, it's really limited to, people who are profiting from YouTube are limited to like one person in front of a green screen, that, that sort of thing. And right. that, you know, you, if, you're, if that's you, you can make a couple hundred thousand a year, and that's great. Uh, but for a business or for like a public company, it doesn't really move the needle, obviously. Right. Uh, what, what, what do you think uh, in terms of this next uh, new front with YouTube? They just rolled out, they've announced some changes. I'm not sure you've seen them, but they've announced some changes. What, what do they need to do to kind of change the game? Um, I mean, they're the 100 pound gorilla when they have 80 yeah. pound market oh, share it's, in terms of video views. It's, yeah, and it's just growing. Like, right. I think every video destination sees views going to YouTube. Right. And, it, and I, I, I don't see it. I mean, I don't think it's gonna be like a day where 100% of all video views on the internet are YouTube, but it's surely a trend, and, and I attribute that to just them having a great player that you know works all the time. Right. And for anybody else who's trying to market off of YouTube, I think the most important thing is having a dependable video player, and it sounds so simple, and it sounds like such blocking and tackling, but when you see a link on Facebook that links to a YouTube video, you don't click it and say, maybe this won't work. Whereas if you go to like a, I don't know, like a CNN video, you're like, it might play in this browser, it might not. So, so they've they figured that out really well. And, and I think that's why we see a lot of people uh, going to there, because they know what, what the experience would be like. And in terms of what they have to do, I think it, it might just be put all, I mean, this is you know, my, uh, taking a wild guess without knowing all of the, the info, having all the info they have, you know, instead of doing like 100 different channels, why not like five, and then you make Game of Thrones, and like, it's kind of like the Netflix strategy, like make something that people are talking about and must watch. And, you know, I don't think there's been anything like that yet. Um, I, I think that, I think that, could be it. I, someone also suggested uh, if Google bought the World Cup rights and put it on YouTube, it would be, I mean, that's, you, you would have to go to YouTube. Right. Um, but I, you know, I doubt they'll do that. <laughs> 
so there are a lot of folks in the audience that are also on the, the partner or uh, supplier or seller side uh, that represent a lot of television, you know, classic television uh -huh. networks as well. Give us a perspective of where you think the TV industry is going. You know, uh, ESPN spoke, um, so did Univision. So yeah. give us a sense of where you think that landscape is going and how advertisers and marketers should be thinking about it in the next maybe year or two. I mean, I, I, I think people will still watch, I'm um, still watch TV. And like being in the, in the internet video world for 10 years, like it just gets so boring hearing over and over like TV's dying, TV's dying. And it, it just, uh, it really doesn't. I, I think the future of TV will be in uh, co-viewing. And I think there will be things that you co-view like live events or even like tent pole kind of stuff. Like people say, to use Game of Thrones again, we need to watch the premiere of Game of Thrones. We're going to watch it together. We're going to tweet about it together. Uh, and so, so there will be that. And then there will be everything else. And by everything else, I mean internet video, video on demand, basically anything that's not viewed in a communal experience. And, and it, so I think you'll have kind of broadcast TV uh, with, with live events and the Emmys and, and all that stuff. And then everything else. And I think there will be a day where you, you go through your IPTV interface, and whether it's Apple TV or Roku or whatever, and there's Comedy Central and College Humor and The Onion and FX. And it really doesn't matter what, uh, whether it was a TV channel or a cable channel or uh, a YouTube channel. It's just a brand. And you just subscribe to, to brands you like. I, I think that's, that's where it's going. Any fear of cord cutting or no? Um, I, I don't. I think it's it's always greatly overestimated in the near term. Yep. Uh, but I, I, you know, like uh, like we heard yesterday, it's when people graduate from college, they might not get cable. Right. And uh, and I see it. I mean, my my girlfriend's on uh, the show Girls on HBO, and when people go up to her and say they like the show, I always ask, where do you watch it? Because I'm curious where like, people in their early 20s are watching HBO. And so many people say, I watch it on HBO Go. We have it at my house at home. And it's, it's just the way I see it, it, just the, the way I see it going. Like, people are finding new ways to watch, uh, to watch programming that that's, doesn't involve a cable box in their you know, in their home hooked up to a flat screen. Right. So let's get back. Well, I'll do one more question and, and open it up mm -hmm. to the audience. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. Um, so <clears throat> uh, let's bring, get back to this social sharing piece and connect that to television. Yep. Um, you have this uh, social sh sharing kind of point of worldview, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. How does that work in this not only current world of television that you're explaining to us, but also in that new world of um, or that potentially new world that you're seeing as people watch um, on a variety of different platforms, different devices. How do those two worlds connect? Um, there's certainly, you know, advertisers know a little bit about this, but I think most of my clients anyways, I would, to be fair, you know, have a hard time getting their head around all that. Mm -hmm. So explain a little bit about social sharing and how it's connected to televisions and television viewing as well as video viewing or digital video viewing across multiple devices. Yeah, I, I think the, it's, I think it's easy to figure out the kind of co-viewing, broadcast, sports, that thing. Like, I think it will be the TV and whatever platform most people are using at the time. And I think right now, people engage, I see people engage on Twitter more than Facebook. So I think for live events, it's linear TV and Twitter. And for co-viewing of, uh, I guess you call it pre-recorded stuff, I don't think there's, an, um, you know, we saw a lot of uh, demos today. I, I don't know what the emerging player I, will be, or a dominant player will be, if there is one at all. Um, I, I've, heard, I've heard some ideas uh, just you know, around our office. People are like, what if there was a, an, uh, a service where you could team up with other people who are also starting the wire at, you know, two months ago, or who are starting tomorrow, and then you could watch it with them. And we, you know, I've, it's a great idea, but it's it's hard to scale that, and it's hard to uh, 
people watch at their own pace. So I don't, I don't really know if anyone will ever figure out how, how to wrap their head around or, you know, uh, how to crystallize co-viewing of pre-recorded stuff. Because, you know, you used to have this great starting gun of uh, ABC would say, ready, go. And it would be 9 o'clock this Sunday, 9 o'clock next Sunday, and it's just not there anymore. Right. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to open up to the audience. This is our last session and thought uh, super interesting stuff, actually. Um, any questions from the audience? Chirp, chirp. Great. Chirp, chirp. <laughs> it's late, I know. Um, yep. Yes. Could you say a little bit about how you were trying to position that? I mean, I, I love Vimeo, but I just want to hear from you. Sure. You so I'm right now I'm more focused on college humor, but I obviously still keep up with the Vimeo people. And I think since the day it was started, the, the prop is, you know, the, we started it before YouTube. And we, when people would post copyrighted content, we would delete it. And uh, so you had, so obviously, you know, they didn't. And uh, you know, we, we see how, how the sites are different now. And it's always been focused on creators. And I think that leaves, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out uh, electronic sell-through and monetization, like direct uh, viewer pays creator. And I think nobody's better positioned for that than Vimeo. Because the people who are uploading videos to Vimeo are the people who made the videos. And that's something that a lot of other video sharing sites can't say. And so I, I think they're experimenting with that now. They did tip jar and they've done some paid content. But I, I think, you know, if you say like that Vimeo is the, the apple of video sharing sites, and it, it might be smaller, but it has a, a very kind of like design oriented, uh, that type of user, that type of high end user, I think they can find success there. Any other questions? If not, I actually have one, but okay. any other questions? Tell me a little bit about what your point of view is on Xbox and what Microsoft is trying to do with Xbox in the home. Is that important? Is that an important distribution I, vehicle for you? I, and uh, should, should television networks and other content producers think about yeah, Xbox I, or other over-the-top? We are, we are on every over-the-top platform that we can with the exception of Xbox. Why and is that? Because to build an Xbox app, it's about Two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars, mm. and it's something that we're <laughs> we will probably do, but right now we haven't, just because that there's that barrier to entry. Um, whereas, does, like, does Microsoft help you with that? I mean, uh, they it, it would seem to me they would want that bit, distribution of the content so more people. Shift yeah, away. I'm sure it'll work itself out. As yeah. uh, but but we're on Roku and uh, Boxy and, and and all the other ones. Uh, but for, for our demographic, especially. We're going to have to be on Xbox sooner or later because it's you know that's young men and that might replace their cable interface. Thank you. It probably <laughs> you just gave me a compliment. No problem. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but that's that's our demo and we'll be on it sooner or later. And with the movie that we have coming out, it comes out in July. We're l already looking at you know what are all the places we're going to sell it because it's going to be a, a day and date release. And Xbox is it's Apple TV, Xbox. Those are like the main two. Yeah. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll be on there eventually. Right. What do you think, uh, so out of, out of all your distribution platforms that you have, how is that shifting? You've got stuff, you've got, like you said, a really good branded content web-based property. You have the YouTube channel, then you have these over-the-top stuff. Where, mm -hmm. How do you see that shifting, and, and how do you see uh, time shifting in terms of viewership across multiple, uh, I would say, screens? So I'm talking desktop, just like the, 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 the four, actually, I'm not going to do uh -huh. the fifth, meaning in the card, don't worry about it, I'm not too, uh -huh. but yeah, yeah, that's a little early for that, but yeah. not that I'm disagreeing with the other presenter, but, but I'm, I'm talking desktop, laptop, um, you know, tablet, smartphone. Yeah, so desktop Telephone. is, you know, growing a little bit, mobile's growing a significant amount, YouTube's growing a ton, yep. um, and, uh, and I think the, the key for us is, it, we have these kind of like philosophical conversations about the future of the site and the future of advertising. And I'm kind of of the belief, everyone's trying to figure out mobile and tablets. I'm of the belief that if you, if you can nail responsive design, which means 
collegehumor.com, you know, there, there's three versions of it, or there's, a, there's mobile, and there's tablet, and there's desktop. And it just adjusts to the size of your screen. And if you can get there and have it be the same experience, you don't really need to figure out a different strategy for mobile monetization than you do for PC monetization, because it's playing the same video ads, and it's, it has the same display. You might, you know, some of the stuff we, units we do, like skins across the entire border, might not show up on mobile. But, you know, you can do other kind of banner things. Um, so I'm, I'm bullish on mobile, where I, I see a lot of other people kind of afraid of it. I'm, I, I think that it will work itself out. And if you look at the history of phones and video, we've, it's gone completely from closed systems to open. I mean, do you remember you would have like a Sprint phone in like 2005 and you could, they had like three different video providers that you could choose from and it just keeps getting more open and more open and I don't, I don't see why an Android phone with a big screen, I don't see how that's different from a, a MacBook Air that might have a 13 inch screen. So um, as, as those things grow, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on mobile and also I think, I really think people will keep using laptops and desktops. It's, I, I think just because something came out later doesn't mean it's necessarily better and I, joke, I was joking with uh, friends the other day, like, if someone told you, okay, you can have your, your iPad, but then there's also a, you get a mouse and a keyboard, uh, would you take it? And it's like, well, yeah, that's a desktop. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, I'm, you know, excited about the, the future, uh, especially with uh, mobile, and I think YouTube will figure it out, and, uh, and our own O's are still chugging along. Great. Uh, we have time for one more question and then we're going to close for the day. Um, anybody in the audience? I'll leave it up to you. Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> anybody? Voodoo economics? I mean, video? I'm just kidding. Those are bad late day jokes. You're supposed to <laughs> laugh with me. Okay, so I think we've, uh, we've wrapped for the day. It was, it was actually a real pleasure. Great. Great to meet you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>